Well, an Auburn newcomer lead the Tigers in receiving this season. Freezing temperatures are likely for several hours inland and a few hours closer to the coast. Yes. You are Locked On Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Joining us for a little Ferg Friday action, Justin Ferguson with the Auburn Observer and Ferg. I'm of the mindset that the two most recent additions to the wide receiver room for Hugh Freeze's offense I mean, you talk about high ceilings with Shane Hooks and Jair Shorter. I think there's a very real chance that one of these two guys lead Auburn to receiving this season. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with you. I would probably, if I had to pick, I'd still personally lean Javarius Johnson. Because I, I think Javarius Johnson is going to get a ton of targets in this off, especially when you think of like the RPOs, the quick hitting stuff, his experience. But yeah, yeah. I mean, big play potential for both of those guys with Shane Hooks. In terms of yardage, man, these guys could rack it up. Uh, Shane Hooks, Great catch radius, massive hands. Uh, Phil Montgomery telling uh, me last week when we were in, um, when we were up in North Alabama, he's like, "Yeah, he has a four X glove." And when he shook my hand for the first time, his fingers just kept wrapping around it, and I was like, "Good grief!" Yeah, that's. I mean, why not go get a receiver like that? Uh, Hooks had some good numbers at Ohio. Obviously, some great numbers at Jackson State. Right. Um, he's looking for a chance to potentially get in, get to the next level. I, I like, a, I like it a lot. He has a potential, I think to be that kind of go up and get it dude that Auburn just hadn't had since Seth Williams. I think Cameron Brown's got some of that to his game as well, but hooks with the experience with all that. And then Jair shorter, it's just, can he stay healthy? And when he's healthy, he does nothing but just make big play after big play after big play. Might not be a guy who gets four five, six targets a game or catches a game, but man, his numbers are kind of dumb when you think about uh, somebody well over 20 yards of catch and like, you know, scoring a touchdown on almost half of his catches last season at North Texas. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't need a whole lot of targets to do something with it based on what we've seen. 23 catches, 11 touchdowns, I think, was that ratio. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and it seemed like there were some concerns about his health, and then it just kind of went away after a week. So I don't know if – sure if he got different opinions from Auburn's medical staff, or if it's like, you know what, you're worth it. Your upside is worth the roster spot. I don't know. It could be any number of things, Ferg. But Freeze said recently that they yeah. cleared him and everything with the doctors. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things. When you've missed as much time as he has had over the years, there's always going to be a risk involved with that. Um, but I do think it's worth it. You know, even if he's, let's just say he's not able to get a full season under his belt. Still, I mean, his speed and his explosiveness – on the outside, Auburn doesn't have that. The last couple of seasons, their best deep ball threat has been Javarius Johnson, who really good receiver, but five eight five nine. You know, right. it's 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 hard for you to kind of build a, a vertical passing game uh, when that's your best option out there in terms of stretching the field. So we've talked about how Hugh Freeze loves big wide receivers, mm -hmm. big outside wide receivers, and it seems like now there's four of those guys, right? Jair Shorter, um, Shane Hooks, Camden Brown and Nick Mardner. What yep. do you think those four guys look like from a rotation standpoint? And do you think over the course of the season or even maybe over the course of summer and fall camps, um, is there somebody that can kind of drop back behind all of those? Because I think the big loser in all of this is Mardner. Like, yep. I, I think Nick Mardner's path to playing time got more difficult. I think Mardner could end up, and this is just speculation on my part, I wouldn't be surprised sure. if Mardner ended up being a guy like what we saw with Sal Canella a few years back where it's like, red zone packages. They did some of this with Landon King also the last couple of seasons where it's like, you yeah. know, he might not be a guy that is an every down dude or a dude that is going to play, you know, the majority of the snaps a wide receiver. But when when you can isolate him against a smaller defensive back or you're even a linebacker, you can go go with it. I also think you got to keep in mind with this group, you're thinking about split ends. I think Shorter's got an, a, a, an ability a little on the shorter end compared to those guys, you know, Still a big dude with with a good catch radius. I think you can. Those guys are going to play down the know. middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It fits there. It, those guys are going to play in the slot too. I mean, there's going to be times when Auburn goes four wide and they're going to want a big dude to attack over the middle, and it might not always be Rivaldo Fairweather uh, who does that. So, um, you know, there's a scenario where I, you know, I think there were some people when you see Shane Hooks come in, like, oh man, I thought people were really really high on Cameron Brown. I think that can still be true. I think you can play those guys together. 
I think you can rotate them out. And, and, and looking at the history of the offense from Hugh Freeze and Philip Montgomery, they want to have five or six guys for the most part who they can rely on. And I think in a vertical passing game like Auburn's going to want to have where they stretch the field, you know, you're going to want some of these bigger guys to kind of kind of make it happen. Yeah, I mean, the the idea of that is exciting because mm-hmm. I mean, even, I mean, we certainly saw this with Harson, and we, I mean, we pretty much saw it with Gus too, almost frustratingly so, where it's like, okay, you are this outside wide receiver. You are this slot receiver. And like, there was no like change. Very little changeover, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- there was a stint there where they're like, we're not going to put Seth Williams and Anthony Schwartz on the field at the same time because they're the same position. It's like, that's dumb. Like, that's the Eli Stove <laughs> was, it, it wasn't on the field a ton at the same time as like a, um, as like a Ryan Davis or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was, yeah. It was very, it was a lot stricter. Right. And so hopefully we see a little bit more flexibility as far as like, let's just get the talented pass catchers on the field. Like, let's figure out how to, yeah. how to use them as much as possible and help set up whoever's playing quarterback to be able to have you know the best options available to them. So that's something I'm excited to see. And, and I know that's more work. Mm-hmm. You know, there's more like oh, yeah. calls that you have to work on. And, you know, in these situations we do this, but like this coaching staff seems to be perfectly okay with work, which, which is something that, that I think could be a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, this pass, they want to throw the ball and they want to, you know, move move it down the field. They have quarterback, uh, they have a quarterback in place with with Peyton Thorne transferring in that has experience doing that and throwing the ball a good bit uh, and, and throwing it deep and doing a lot of a variety of things with it. So, yeah, it's just can you put it all together? I think it's going to be a work in progress. I think this season is going to be very much a work in progress for the passing game. Yeah, that could still lead to some really really good numbers. Um, but yeah, I think continue to kind of preach patience, especially with the fact that you've got three guys when you add uh, Burton in as well, Caleb Burton, like you have three guys that are going to be coming in in the fall that are going to have to learn on the fly to have a chance to give you what you wanted when they were coming, uh, coming out of the transfer portal. So it may take a little while for those guys to get going. So you've got, you've got Javaris Johnson right now, if you had to pick leading the team in receiving right now. Yeah. I mean, maybe receptions like yardage is interesting just because, you know, I think Hooks and Shorter are guys who could definitely challenge that with it. Cannon Brown, I mean, I, I Cannon Brown is still going to be a guy I think is going to get a lot, but yeah, I, I keep going back to the fact that there's a lot of RPOs, there's a lot of quick hitting stuff in this offense, and that's where Javarius Johnson's been at his best. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's got the most experience and the most production coming back. And I think a healthy full season to Javarius Johnson in this offense could be a lot of fun. Yeah, there's something about Jair Shorter to me where I'm just like, this guy, the numbers. The numbers, man, you can't ignore it. You can't ignore somebody who like was one of the best big play receivers in college football last year. Yeah, yeah, and I, I just I will watch his tape. I just think he's got that it, that swag. Now the health thing matters, right? You know, you got to sure. be available to play to to get on the field. But if he can stay healthy, dude, I, Jair Shorter is my pick. So we'll see. All right, you, you talked about the offense and they want to throw the football. How do the quarterbacks come into play? With all this, we'll discuss in just a moment right here on Locked on Auburn. Today's show brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. FanDuel is the best place to wager on all of your sports betting action. And look, if you're a new customer that hasn't tried out FanDuel, you've been wanting to. Now's literally the best time ever to do that because new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to two thousand. And five hundred dollars is no reason not to do this. Two thousand five hundred dollars back in bonus bets if that first bet does not win. So, head over to fanduelcom slash on. Get a no sweat first bet up to two thousand five hundred dollars. That's fanduelcom slash on. Fanduel is the official sports betting partner of the NBA and the Locked On Podcast Network. Joining us, Justin Ferguson of the Auburn Observer, hanging out with us. Okay, so the battle between Peyton Thorne and Robbie Ashford. And I'll list Holden Gurner too, just because I feel like you have to at this point. But mm-hmm. how do you think the bringing in all these receivers that clearly they want to stretch the field? Yep. How do you think this impacts the quarterback battle? Because like Robbie, I don't think he's that great of a passer, but like his deep passing numbers were decent. Like mm-hmm. they, they were fine. You know, and then Peyton Thorne, you know, he's done a little bit of everything. So how do you anticipate 
these new receivers coming into this locker room impacting the battle between Peyton Thorne and Robbie Ashford? Yeah, I think if you can go down the field and get it, Auburn's got some quarterbacks for you. Peyton Thorne's deep ball numbers were really good. Uh, you know, these these last couple of seasons at Michigan State, even in the times where the shorter and the intermediate stuff wasn't always clicking for him, he still had a really, really good deep ball. Um, I think he's going to play off of Auburn's running game really, really well. And so to have wide receivers to impact that, I think is going to be good. The interesting thing here is, is that I think both Thorne and Ashford can provide the same opportunities for the wide receivers just in very different ways. And what I mean by that is Peyton Thorne is a great deep ball passer and is a great, great off of play action. Great with a, with a, uh, with a strong running game next to him. His numbers reflect that. Robbie Ashford runs so well that yeah. he commit, he makes defenses hit commit. And so like, there are going to be opportunities for you to win in one-on-one -on -one coverage. There are going to be opportunities for you to go up and get it and, and, and win your matchup. I think both of those guys can bring the same kind of thing to the table. Just they're going to do it in very different ways. This offense looks different if Peyton Thorne runs it, and it looks different between if Robbie Ashford runs it. And if Peyton Thorne ends up being the starter, like I think a lot of people would predict, there is still opportunities for Robbie Ashford to come in yeah. and do things. I mean, I think a package and packages with Robbie Ashford would work really, really well because – he he has shown enough, especially with that deep ball you were talking about. He's shown enough that even if he is not the most efficient and accurate passer on this team, if if teams say, "Oh, Robbie's in it," they're going to run the ball, and then he pulls that thing back and and lets it fly. I mean, he had some really really good throws last year. The touchdown in the Iron Bowl obviously stands out in a lot of people's minds. But sure, you know, even if he's not the guy this season, there's a way to do that, and and I think your wide receivers should be able to take advantage of it. Um, just the way they've built uh, the, the, this offense to kind of uh, take advantage of the running game, whether it is Peyton Thorne playing off of his backs and the good work he does in play action and elsewhere, or it's Robbie Ashford being one of the, I mean, last season he was one of the top five rushing quarterbacks in all of college football. Right, right. I I'm interested to see when they are installing stuff this fall, how different the two offenses are with the quarterbacks and mm -hmm. like how, how many reps in practice are you going to dedicate to that? Because like you said, I, I believe the offenses would look different regardless of who, depending on who starts, but Hugh freeze doesn't have a lot of time. I mean, he kind of threw no. this raw like way, like there's a lot of dudes that came in in this second transfer window. They're yep. going to be big contributors. Like you can't waste a lot of time to yeah. do this. Like I think he's going to be forced to make a decision somewhat early. Unfortunately, you've got time, right? You've got a few games to kind of figure things out before you go to Cal and have that first test, but there's just not a lot of time. So I'm interested to see when reports come out of practice, like what that balance looks like. Yeah. I think it could be a situation where once you get a scrimmage down or two scrimmages down, you say, okay, now we have the decision. And maybe if you don't even announce it or if you could do a case where it's like hey this is a guy who's going to start but we're still going to still going to play all of our other receivers which is something that freeze has done in the past especially yeah. at Ole miss i think you still want to have that kind of concentration you want to know hey here's the guy who's going to be getting the first reps maybe the bulk of the reps um and then let it see how it plays out because you're going to learn a lot those first few weeks of the year uh umass cal and sanford th that umass game i mean especially now that i know that that game's going to be in the middle of the afternoon and everybody at UMass is going to feel like they're melting. Um, <laughs> it's it's going to be, t you know, it, you might not get the stiffest challenge in the world, but you're going to learn a lot those first few weeks, and and you're going to learn a lot about your quarterback specifically. How ridiculous is Cal's kickoff time at nine thirty? How ridiculous? <laughs> yeah, is it's 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 hilarious because it is seven thirty prime time kickoff out on the on, on the West Coast. That Alabama Texas game being being such a big deal, um, and and you know I. I I don't want to go ahead and, and rain on your parade Auburn fans even worse because 930 local kick 1030 for those of you on the east on the eastern uh, time zone is bad. But I'm already imagining a scenario where yeah. that <laughs> Alabama that Alabama Texas game it ain't going to get done in the window. They think it is college football games always go longer than we expect. And yeah. like I could see them holding the kickoff for a little, a little maybe not super, super late. But if it's a competitive game and ah. Uh, it could get closer to ten o'clock before that thing kicks off. You tweeted this all. out. Like, did you? Could you confirm this was the latest game in Auburn football history? So somebody dug up an old uh, Plainsman uh, article uh, from when Auburn went to um, Arizona uh, in 1973, and that game was also a 7:30 local kick. So it would it, it it is a tie. It is a tie between 
Um, the only other time, and the only other time Auburn has played a Pac-12 team on the road uh, was when they played USC uh, in 2003, right. and that was a that was like a five o'clock local kick over there. It was like six or seven by the time it was. It was yeah, in hopefully, Auburn. this goes better than that one did. Yeah, you would think. I I I I would. You know, USC not quite the not quite the superpower. I mean, uh, Cal not quite the superpower USC was back then. Yeah, um, right. You would right. think. Um, man, that game though. I mean, we've talked about that game a lot over the last week or so. I mean, what an important matchup. I yeah. Mean, and, and when that was announced, I was like, Cal, okay, whatever. But I mean, you talk about a, a team where that has a ton of question marks on it with Auburn going up against a team with Cal that's like got a it's pretty much the same team from a year ago. They probably yeah. got a good feeling about what they could be. Just hope to be a little bit better. It's just, I mean, you talk about like a prove it type situation. Like, I mean, that, that'd be big for Hugh Freeze to go out there and, and get that uh, that first road win. Yeah, I did it uh, earlier this week at the Observer. You look at SP projections, it has Auburn like, I think it's like eight to 10 point favorite against Cal. Cal's not a very talented team, but they're going to bring back uh, a good bit of experience. I'll be interested to see if that TCU transfer ends up being their quarterback uh, for them mm-hmm. this year. Uh, but I mean, it is a it is a Justin Wilcox team. Usually, that means they're pretty good or at least pretty sound on defense. Um, so I mean, it won't be the it won't be the easiest thing in the world by any means. Auburn should win, and they will be projected to win. Uh, but that is kind of a tone setter type of game uh, that you get in, and hopefully, you're three and zero when you when you roll into SEC play. Yeah, yeah. And then that's another big one. And at, at Texas that's, A&M, that's the hinge point. I, 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 the hinge point games of this season for me. And we talked about it recently on our podcast at Texas A&M. Um, the Arkansas game at the end of the season and mm-hmm. uh, the Ole Miss game in the middle. I think those three, how Auburn does in those three games, cause I think can be a microcosm of how good this season is as a whole. Because those are the the real like, you know, if you sweep them, God, you're going to have an incredible year. If you win more, if you if you go two and one, that's going to be a really good season. One and two at or zero and three, you're going to have work to do. And so that's that's that. Those are the hinge point games, and I think you can throw state in there as well at home. Yeah, we ranked. We, we did a show earlier this week ranking yeah. the five most important games, and my list was A and M at one, Ole Miss at home two, mm. the Iron Bowl because I felt like I had to put it on the list at three. And then I forget what order, but it was at Arkansas and Mississippi State at home. Or my, yeah. my four or five. I forget. Those are your, those first, are your but. swing games, and those are your those are your mm, we'll see games. And I'll say the Alabama game, the Iron Bowl. Look, I mean, I'm not, I'm 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 not going to sit here in sunshine pump for you, but I will say this: eleven games into the year, we know historically a good Auburn team playing Alabama and Jordan Hare, things happen in that game. It is usually not a it is usually not a blowout. Uh, by by any means, and I'll be I'm fascinated to see what Alabama does this year, especially with their quarterback situation. Yeah, they're they're in an interesting situation for, for sure. sure. All right, Ferg, you cover this basketball team better than anybody. It appears that the roster is done or dang close. So let's discuss that in just a moment, right here on Locked On Auburn. I want to encourage you to join the Locked On Auburn Discord. It is free. All you have to do is click the link in the episode description down below. Ferg Janai Broom announces that he is not entering the draft and he is back at Auburn. And then Jalen Williams saw Janai Broom's graphic and was like, I want a graphic. And so he put out his I'm back graphic as well. And everyone's was like, didn't know this was a thing, but cool. Glad you're coming back, Jalen. So now Dylan that Cardwell as well. Dylan Cardwell as well. The band is back together. And so it looks like Bruce Pearl and his staff, they've got a solid two deep at all five mm-hmm. spots. Then Lior Berman, wherever you want to stick him, you know, is for, for some extra depth. So what stands out to you when you look at the makeup of this roster? What's the biggest thing that stands out to you? I've written about this the last couple of weeks to the Observer. So for those of you who subscribe, you, you, you'll know some of this at this point. But um, this team has been remade stylistically to resemble a lot of the earlier Pearl teams. This is a pace and space team. Uh, real quick stat for you. The guys who left Auburn this offseason, their career three-point percentages at Auburn, less than 30% combined. The guys they're bringing in, the three transfers, nearly 40% career three-point shooters. Then you get Aiden Holloway, who's one of the best shooters in the class. This is a team that's going to be able to play fast. This is going to be a team that's going to be able to shoot a lot better. Talent-wise, pure talent-wise, not there's not a you know Jabari Smith or even a Walker Kessler on this team. Aiden Holloway... It could be a really, really special player. He's sure. just very different because of his size compared to like other draft prospects. Um, but like 
I think of Janai Broom coming back, a finesse big man, and I wrote about it earlier this week. He thrives when Auburn was shooting well last year. You look at the games where Auburn shot well from deep last season, Janai was super, super efficient um, in those games with, with his offense, and, and it helped his defense as well. I think Auburn's going to play faster. I think they're going to take more threes. I think they're going to be able to play a more entertaining brand of basketball because this roster is kind of built stylistically to do what it needs to do to play that kind of run-and-gun style. On top of that, you're going to have guys coming from FIU and JUCO, although you know, you, you, in, in the case of Chad baker Bazaar, he has played San Diego State. Uh, right. You got a guy coming in from from D two. You got a kid coming from high school that are that son. You have others who have to step up and play. The thing about this this team though is that style can overcome some of the some of the talent gaps that we could, that you could see when you roll up against a team like an Arkansas or Kentucky or whoever that has you know all these five stars and elite elite players. So um, I think it's a really good reload. You know, you didn't get everybody you wanted uh, for for sure, and some of those guys ended up staying in the draft process. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I, I do like this roster a lot. I think they, I think they complement each other really, really well. It's easy to see where the pieces fit. Yeah, yeah, and anybody that San Diego State wants to play basketball, like that's usually a good sign. But also, oh, yeah. uh, I mean, you mentioned the D two aspect of it with with Cheney Johnson. And it's like, well. He played against Auburn in the exhibition game and played well. He he belonged, right? Mm-hmm. Like he, it's not like he was physically outmatched by an SEC team. And I've talked about it before with him because he reminds me so much about it. But like D two transfer, it kind of to me sticks out like a JUCO uh, transfer. He reminds me a ton of Malik Dunbar, and I think okay. a lot of Auburn fans would love to have like another Malik Dunbar. Yeah. yeah, you would love to have a Malik Dunbar on your team again. He was so key for that for that uh, Final Four team and just. You know, he did so much for you. I think Chaney Johnson, different type of player slightly, but, man, dunker, energy, can shoot the ball, uh, you know, uh, pretty well, slashes uh, at an excellent rate. Like, that's that's what you want. And then Chad baker Mazzara, one of the best shooters in the country uh, at any level of college basketball. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, Denver Jones, I mean, it's been a while since Auburn got Denver Jones. I don't want people – and it's even been even longer since I got Aiden Holloway – Aiden speaks for itself, five-star McDonald's All-American. Do not sleep on Denver Jones. That guy's style of play, I think, is exactly what they need at the two-guard spot. And yeah. he and he's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and I assume he will start at the two there. So we saw this, just to kind of play devil's advocate for a second, mm-hmm. we saw Bruce Pearl do this a few seasons ago when he went out and got a Katie Johnson, and he went out and got a Zep, and he went out and got a Wendell Green, and all these guys' numbers were very good shooting pre-Auburn. And then they come sure. to Auburn and they aren't able to really do that again. Why do you think that was? Is there any chance that this happens again? I think those numbers were good. I think uh, there were a lot of high volume there, I think, with, with some of those guys. It just uh, – Katie Johnson, and, and we'll see it with KD. I mean, Katie's a great example. He shot super well his first season until he hurt his wrist. And when he hurt his wrist, it was never the same. Sure. And last season, once he got his shot kind of back to where he thought it was, you know, what it used to be, got that heart back, he was back to hitting three pointers like he did in his Georgia days and early days. So I think it was a thing for him. Uh, you know, the case with a guy like Wendell, smaller guy having to step up in classification, didn't have as much space, didn't have as much room, I think, as 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 he did in the past shooting threes. And then, yeah, the grand mystery to me is always going to be like, Zep not being able to translate what he was on offense to college Charleston to Auburn. Like I, I, I never was able to kind of really put that together. And so, yeah, there's always a risk and there's always a thing of like, just because you lied it up, like Chad Baker three point numbers are nuts. That doesn't mean you're going to immediately come in and do that in the, in the sec, but there's a good chance. So I think those guys who are coming in, their yeah. numbers are better um, uh, on, on top of that. But yeah, like there's always going to be something like, mm, well, maybe, maybe they can, they can put it all together. I think the good news for them, though, is they don't have to do it all on their own. Jani Broom's coming back with the with, with first fourth year. Jalen Williams is back for his fifth year. Katie Johnson's played a good bit of ball. Trey Donaldson's coming off a strong end of the end of last season. Chris Moore is the glue guy you want to have on the floor, um, you know, to, to give you some good minutes and hustle plays. Like, there's it's a good mix of new and old. And I, this team's just going to be hungry, you know? I'm not yeah. saying the team last year wasn't, but like, You've got a bunch of dudes who are fighting for their for their future basketball careers, uh, and, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see them, especially when you can throw in a guy like Aiden Holloway, who, oh by the way, he's you know the second best recruit Auburn's ever signed out of high school. Number one was Jabari Smith, 
and, and number you know number three number three was Sharif Cooper. We all know how good those dudes were as freshmen. So yeah, there, there's a there's a high there's a high ceiling there for him. No question. Justin Ferguson, how can people check out everything you've got going on right now? Yeah, AuburnObserver.com. Sign up there. It's six dollars a month or sixty dollars a year. We're rolling out newsletters, podcasts. I'm gonna have a depth chart projection, some fun predictions with that coming out next week. Uh, we've got our podcast with myself and Painter Sharpless and Dan Peck. Um, basketball, football, we've got it all going on. AuburnObserver.com. Sign up. We email everything to you pretty much most weekday mornings at 6 a.m. Central Time. You're going to get something from the Observer. Yes, it's worth every penny. I subscribe and highly recommend you do the same. AuburnObserver.com. You can find all my written work at AuburnDaily.com, and we will see you on Monday. This has been Locked on Auburn.